Fabio. This is Daria, and welcome to another Two Kids interview. And today, we are interviewing one of my favorite new authors, Emily Barth Eisler. Ms. Eisler has written two wonderful books so far, Aftermath and The Color of Sound. Thank you so much for being here with us today. Oh, thank you so much for having me, and I'm so honored by your introduction. This is great. I'm really excited. Before we get into your writing, we'd love to talk about some of your other adventures. What is the most fun story you have from your acting days? Oh my gosh, it's hard to pick just one. I think the thing that I loved most about acting was working as part of a team um, and you know, being in a, a group of people who were putting on a play together or a musical. And I just loved some of the sort of practical jokes and inside jokes that developed over time working with a group of people and um being a young kid working with mostly adults i think i found those some of those inside jokes and practical jokes to be like particularly exciting because i loved that i was part of something even though i was a lot younger than a lot of the people i worked with so it's hard to pick out any one thing um but just the the overwhelming kindness and fun of the the people i got to work with um, you also worked for two years for the Baltimore Orioles. Uh, Orioles, right. <laughs> I'm not a baseball person. What was your, <laughs> uh, what was that like? And um, did you have a favorite player from then? Um, I mean, I think anybody my age from Baltimore probably loves Cal Ripken as much as I do. Uh, number eight shortstop, uh, one of the most incredible players in baseball and certainly for the Orioles. But the time I worked for them, there were so many amazing players. Um, Chris Hoyles was a great catcher, Brady Anderson, uh, BJ Surhoff. There were just, uh, it was a great time uh, when I worked there, um, the 1997 season, it was like a really good season for the Orioles. It was a particularly good time to be there. They they didn't win the World Series, but they got pretty close. Um, and I I started out working for them, you know, thinking I was a fan. I mean, I was a fan, but I learned so much more. You know, I thought I knew a lot about baseball and working there, I learned a lot more. I worked for one season for the Baltimore Orioles and then the next season, I worked for two of their farm teams, the AA and AAA teams at the time. Um, and so that was a cool experience, too, to get to know some of the players who were very young and very new to baseball, and they were hoping to become Baltimore Orioles, but they were, um, you know, sort of practicing at the time, and uh, it was very inspiring to watch them. I'm definitely not a Yankees fan. Yeah, me neither. I am, though. Oh, no! <laughs> That's okay. We can still be friends. I'm I'm trying to become a Los Angeles Dodgers fan now that I live here, and I, I just need to log more time and fall in love with the team because my heart still really belongs to the Orioles. Learning about you and knowing what you've written, your books are very personal. Do you think that makes your stories more impactful because they're personal? That's a great question. I'd like to think so. I think that um, something I didn't understand for a long time about being a writer or an author was that the more that I was willing to give of myself and share, not that none of my books are autobiographical, they're certainly not based on my life. Most of the characters are totally fictional and sometimes an amalgamation of people that I've met or situations I've been in. So. None of it is autobiographical, but I do think that drawing from my own experience helps me tell a story that's hopefully more real, more honest, and maybe more vulnerable. I think one thing I learned um, from the time I started writing up until now is the value of being comfortable sharing a little bit more about myself and what that adds to the narrative. Um, but that's something I didn't feel comfortable doing until I was fully an adult and had figured some things out. I think when I wrote stories as a younger person, I was still learning about myself. And so it was harder to share more of me. Um, but I, I do like to pull things from particularly my childhood um, in The Color of Sound. Um, it's not autobiographical, but there are definitely a lot of details that I borrowed from my childhood. I based the her grandparents' house on a house that I used to visit that was my 
god grandparents house and a dog that they had that I modeled Vienna the dog after and the pool that they had that I used in the story so I do like to pull elements because um those are some of my most treasured and visceral memories and bringing them to the story I think adds another layer to it um, from both your book Aftermath and the Arc to Cool Feller, um, gun violence is something that you um is like obviously very important to you. Uh what message would you have for young people and like what they could do, if anything, to help? Oh, I love that question so much. My message would be that there's so much hope. It's a fixable problem. I think a lot of times people feel overwhelmed when they think about the issue of gun violence in America. But we're so close to being able to close a lot of the loopholes and the way to fix it is by electing government and politicians who want to change this as well. Um, and so I've gotten really involved with some volunteer organizations that help create and push forward legislation and laws that will help create an environment where we can eliminate a lot of school shootings and mass shootings in general. And um, I think it's just really common for people to feel hopeless and say, you know, I'm just one person, what can I do? And one thing that I've experienced working uh, as a volunteer in this field is that any one person can make a huge impact, especially the more we group together and, and our collective voice becomes louder. There's so much change we can make. And I, I think hopefully with this coming upcoming election, there are a lot of people on the ballot who care passionately about changing the laws around gun violence. And I hope that if we can elect those people, we can see some really major change, hopefully really soon. We hope so too. Yeah. Yeah. Your Judaism is an important part of your life. I probably should tell you my mom's a cantor and her dad's a rapper. No way, I love that. What is he, what does Yom Kippur mean to you and do you have any breakfast plans? Yes. Okay. Well, a good friend of mine's birthday coincides with Yom Kippur. So luckily she's hosting a nice breakfast party, which is very convenient for everyone. And there will be cake, which is what I always want at breakfast. I mean, traditionally bagels, fruit, yeah. things like that. They're all great, but cake is really always at the top of my list. Um, I love Yom Kippur. Oh Not yeah, donuts? Yeah. Okay, well, you know, there are some similarities to cake. I feel like a good donut is, is really just a cake in, in a circle shape. So we're on the same page. Um, my favorite thing about Yom Kippur is that it's a time for um, sort of slowing down and looking inward. I love the consistency of the rituals that the prayers we read every year are the same prayers that I remember from my childhood that I now get to say with my kids. and. Um, it's sort of a time to to get really quiet and think um, and decide, you know, what what do I feel good about of the past year and what do I want to change going forward or what do I want to work on? I just love that a lot of self-reflection is built into Judaism. I think that um, that's a really good thing for, for any religion um, or, or something that makes Judaism meaningful to me is the... Um, the part of it that really advocates for self-examination and saying like, what am I doing that's working? What am I doing that feels good? How can I help more people? How can I make a difference? Um, so despite the fasting, it's one of my favorite holidays. Yeah, me too. I saw you that you said you, you like to fight the patriarchy. I'm Courtney Dre, my mom will be singing a duet with with Barbara Osfeld, who is the very first female cantor. So we've come a long way, but where would you like us to get to? Well, I think, um, you know, first of all, that's so cool. I, I would love to see a recording of that after Yom Kippur, that sounds awesome. I think um, it's easy to feel like, you know, fighting the patriarchy is one goal, but it's really a series of, a ton of smaller goals um, because every step in the right direction is a step and so we're facing a potentially huge really exciting step which is that you know we have the first female presidential nominee who's also a woman of color there's so many exciting things about Kamala Harris in our upcoming election and I'm a big fan and I really hope that she wins um, 
But it's not just about that. We can also look down ballot at there are so many people doing amazing things and breaking barriers and glass ceilings all the way down ballot too. We have openly gay, openly trans, openly LGBTQ members of legislatures and representatives. We have people fighting for things that are really important. Um, we have so many people who are willing to you know, devote their life to trying to make the world a better place. And I feel like every win should be celebrated, but you know, obviously, like you said, the celebrating the first female canter, things like that, remembering where we've come from is so important. And I just, I can't wait to see where we're going. And I think the representation so incredible for you all, for my kids, for your generation to get to see women in power um, in a way that I didn't get to see as a kid. Um, you know, I, I feel very lucky we've seen more of it recently, but you know, I don't think it occurred to us when I was your age, not to be like quintessential grown up when I was your age, but um, when I was your age, uh, it, it didn't feel possible that a woman could become president. It didn't feel possible that um, so many people could be so openly themselves and be accepted and impactful. So I feel like we've come a long way and uh, here's hoping that soon we have some really exciting new things to celebrate. Um, so we heard your first book that you ever wrote was like never pub like you never found a publisher. Yeah. Um, can we ask like what was the book and would you ever think of like try to be working into it and trying to get it published again? It's a great question. I've thought about that a lot recently. Um, so I like to do my stats like a baseball player, um, speaking of baseball and the Orioles. So when I do school visits and I talk to a group of kids who are a lot of times aspiring writers or storytellers, I want to reassure people by explaining that I think writing is a lot like being a baseball player. So a baseball player can be having a really good season if they're batting 300 or like a great season if they're batting 400 right but what that actually means 300 means three times out of 10 that they go to the that they go up to bat that they're actually getting a hit or getting on base. So when you think of it that way that means seven times out of 10 or even six times out of 10 if they're batting 400 that means the majority of the time they're not getting a hit they're striking out they're fouling they're you know they're not successful. And so it's really made me re-examine the math of how we measure success. Um, I wrote two full books before I wrote Aftermath. And by the time I sold Aftermath, I had written 10 full books. And now I've written 12 books and I've sold four of them. So I like to think of my average as like a batting average. And you know, if I'm doing four mm -hmm. out of 12, I'm basically batting 300 and that would be great for a baseball season. So um, I think it's important to include how the, the quote unquote failures are part of the game. And I don't see them as failures. I think some of those books that I've written that haven't sold yet, I actually did recently go back and revise one and I brought on a co-writer, a friend of mine who's also a writer who I thought could bring something to that story that was missing from when I had written it before. And we rewrote it together and it's a lot funnier and has a lot more energy. So yes, sometimes I do go back and revisit those, but that very first book I wrote, I think I'm not going to revisit, but there are themes of that book I could see myself that I, I think I'm still working out. That first book was about two girls who uh, whose parents used to be married and then they were stepsisters. And when their parents divorced, it was about their relationship. And I think there's something about that theme that I find really fascinating of like what happens when our chosen family becomes unchosen and, and how do we continue to choose each other when people are important to us and what friendship looks like and, you know, building your own family out of friendship. Um, so I'll certainly circle back to those themes, but I don't think I'll take out that exact book anymore because I feel like it's moment, it, it, the time has passed. I would love to read it. I mean, thank you. Maybe I'll like someday put a version of it or a short part of it up online or something, or I don't know. Um, there's definitely something to the theme. So some part of it will make its way out eventually. Um, do you think that you'll write a book about baseball ever? I did. Oh my gosh, I'm so glad you asked. So I have written a book about 
um, sort of a fictionalized version. Again, like I said, I don't write autobiographical, but I did take the sort of basic stats of when I worked at the Orioles, I, um, as I said, I worked for two of their um, minor league teams. So when I worked for the minor league teams, the players were the same age I was. I was 17, 18, and a lot of the players were like 18, 19. Um, and it was really fascinating to sort of see where their lives were going and where my life was going. I was about to start college. A lot of them were just starting to play professional baseball. And so I had this idea of what would it be like if a character like me fell in love with one of those baseball players and uh, and started dating, even though their lives are objectively going in very different directions. Um, so obviously that one is a YA book because the characters are a little older and it's a romance. Um, but it's completed and, uh, you know, fingers crossed some editors are reading it right now and hopefully one of them will want to publish it and I'll get to share it with you all. Um, but it was so fun to sort of use that starting point on my first day of work for the Baltimore Orioles. I ended up um, being asked to go into the locker room of the visiting team, which was the Expos, which they've moved now, but at the time uh, the team was called the Expos and they... Um, I, I was supposed to go into the team and get some quotes from the players about how the game was and and they were in the locker room and they were all changing and showering and I was a 17 year old girl who felt immediately so out of my depth. Um, and so <laughs> I used that as kind of the starting point for my fictional book um, again just an example of how I sort of draw on, on little bits of my experience that I think were funny or interesting or terrifying or all of the above and then use that in a fictional fictional setting to tell a different story. Um, I did not meet and fall in love with the baseball player when I worked there, but um, you know, I sort of thought, okay, what if? And that's where a lot of my ideas come from. Okay, well, good luck with that. And we'll be reading young adult books by the time it comes out. So I know the time readers. is perfect. Yeah, you guys will be you guys will be ready for it. I'll I'll make sure to send you early copies when it finally finds its home. That'd be so exciting. Thank you. Of course. Writing a book is a big commitment. So when you come up with an idea, how do you become sure that this is a story that you want to tell? That is the question. I think that is the thing that all creative types are always wondering. How do you know what to invest your time and your heart in? And so what I've found is kind of, I like to turn it around and I like to ask myself, what is the book that I can't not write? What is the idea that keeps coming up? And because of that, I tend to give myself a lot of time to think about it before I settle on and invest in a book. Um, but what it comes down to is what are the themes and the ideas and the sort of mental pictures that just won't leave me alone? And that's how I know that's the story I need to tell. And honestly, it's oftentimes something that I'm really scared of or some big thing that I'm working through. Like when I wrote Aftermath, it was because I was a, a relatively new mom, my kids were little, and I was thinking about all of the gun violence that I saw on the news, and it really scared me. And I thought, if this is something that really scares me, it probably scares other people too. And what is it like to be a kid, you know, in, in middle school during this moment in time? And, and I did a lot of research because that was the idea that kept coming up. So it's kind of the things that scare me the most or fascinate me the most, or sometimes the things that I need to work on or work through. Um, so I, I like to swim laps, um, and, you know, I live in California, so I'm lucky I can be outdoors at a public pool year round and do a lot of swimming. And when I'm swimming, it kind of allows my brain to quiet down and, and think of ideas. And that's where I brainstorm for a lot of my writing work. And oftentimes that's the time when I sort of keep an eye out and think like what are the ideas that keep coming back to me that kind of really stick and so once i get a sticky idea then i know that's the book i want to work on next um since your books are very personal should your kids be worried about anything that they could end up in the book or like do you like read about them in the books Excellent questions. Y'all are asking better questions than most adults that I talk to. I love this um, and I'm not surprised. So I'm really careful about not putting anything of my kids in the books. We've talked about that. Um, you know, it's funny because when I wrote Aftermath, I wrote the first draft of it in 2015. My son was a newborn. My daughter was four. And so the idea that it would connect with their lives at all felt so far off because they were toddlers and babies, you know, it just didn't feel connected. As they've grown, 
I've had to grow too. And we've had a lot of conversations about boundaries and about what's appropriate. And I'm super, super careful. I want them to feel like they can tell me things about their life with confidence, knowing that it is not going to end up in one of my books, which is why I do take things and feelings from my own childhood and work them into my books. Um, it's helpful, you know, that I do have kids who are middle grade age for some of the logistics, because I know now I, I can see what it's like to be a kid in 2024 to have a phone or to not have a phone to text friends or to have friends who don't text or whatever those issues are. But when it comes to the specifics, I'm still really taking the feelings and the experiences from 30 years ago from when I was that age and putting them in the situations of today if i'm writing a contemporary book because it's so super important to me that i'm never writing about my kids and um it helps they they're having a really different childhood and adolescence than mine so it feels pretty easy to me to sort of draw those boundaries and say this is not you know i'm not gonna dip into that idea and and i'm gonna stick to this you know which feels um, safe for them and respectful of, of their privacy. I don't have a phone. Can you tell my dad it's 2024 and I should have a phone? I, I'm going to leave that one to your parents and I'm going to say there are days when I wish they would take away my phone. So I'm not the right person to advocate for you to have one. Phones are real pros and cons. What is your process when putting a book together? Do you decide the end before the middle or do you put it together in order? Um, I'm an outliner. I'm sure you guys have talked to lots of authors who yeah. have different um, methods of doing it. I learned to outline um, early on when I got really serious about writing books versus writing short stories or articles. And I don't like to start a book without an outline. But the crazy thing is I almost every time, I think actually every time, I end up throwing away my outline about halfway through and start and, and writing a new outline. So I write the outline knowing that the second half of it is probably gonna change, but I still have to write it because it's part of the process. And the reason it often changes is because as I'm writing the first half of the book, I'll get new ideas or the characters will do things that inspire other avenues. And I like to think of writing my writing process after the outline, it's kind of like improv. I don't know if you guys have ever taken an improv class or seen people do improv, but the, the sort of overarching statement for improv is yes and. So I will take my outline and do a yes and with it. I'll sit down to write a chapter and I will start off what my outline says. And then if I get another idea that says, but what if we go this way and try something else? I will yes and it. And sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't, but that's why I generally toss my outline and start over halfway through. Although with, with one exception, which is the final chapter, I think I always know how I want it to end. I usually often write the final chapter towards the beginning of the process, or I have a picture in my mind of how it's gonna end up. And so I may veer off the outline, but I make my way back to the, the end for the most part. You know, sometimes I have to adjust things because the plot has changed or the characters have changed, but I end up kind of at the end regardless of what happens in the middle so far. Um, with a big increase in, um, unfortunately, anti-Semitism, do you think it is more important than ever to have Jewish characters in books? I do. I mean, I think there's two ways that Jewish representation is really important, and I'm proud that uh, I'd like to think my books fill both of these categories. So one category is that when I was growing up, there were basically no no books about Jewish characters unless they were about the Holocaust or uh, someone's bar or bat mitzvah, and even then it was really few and far between. So I do think it's super important to show Jewish people being people throughout history, contemporary, historical, talk about the things that are important to us and have it really be about, you know, have their Jewishness or their Judaism be a big part of the story. But equally important, I think, are what I like to call incidentally Jewish books. Um, Aftermath that is, is an example. So The Color of Sound is a much more overtly Jewish book. Aftermath is an example of what I like to call an incidental Jewish book because there's really not a lot of moments in the book where the characters are doing specifically Jewish things. There's a mention of a rabbi once, there's a mention of 
Lucy's great grandparents who survived the Holocaust. And then beyond that, I don't think there's really a whole lot about her being Jewish. But I think those books are really important, too, because, you know, Jewish people come in all shapes and sizes and uh, different forms of observ of of observantness. I don't know if that's a word. Um, mm -hmm. but it think, is now. OK, it is now. Um, I think it's important to show that there's no one way to be Jewish and that um, it can be as large or small a part of one's life as one chooses, especially when I was growing up and reading books. Um, it was often considered sort of the default that the characters were white and Christian and unless otherwise specified, you could just assume that everybody was white and Christian. That was the majority. Um, so I think it's great to have a story that has nothing to do with religion or faith or customs or anything, but just incidentally it comes up like, oh, this character happens to be Jewish and that doesn't have to be a big part of the plot. It's just part of who they are and it's sort of uprooting um this idea of the default because i want people to realize that you know jews can have all kinds of adventures and stories and you know just like any other underrepresented minority it doesn't have to be the plot it can still just be a detail so i think both kinds of representation are equally important Thanks, Chris. Um, um, your books are powerful, but also very entertaining. Um, do you ever think uh, you have to like change things in your draft to make sure that the messengers are like are telling um a message, but like not making the story boring? I mean, I think that's the big challenge, and that's kind of the question I'm often asking myself is like, I feel a responsibility to make sure that I'm putting goodness and kindness out into the world, but I don't want kids to be like, oh, a message book, you know? So there's a balance to be had. And that's where really my editors come in. I, I've worked with some really amazing, exceptional editors, and they're really good at and have lots of practice at finding that balance between telling a story and spreading a message and sort of where to lean in and where to ease off of that. And, you know, I think that's where it's important to mention that no book is written in a vacuum. It's, it is more of a group activity than I realized. And so once you, um, you know, start writing more professionally and you maybe have an agent and then an editor, and then there are all sorts of people at the publisher who may read the book and weigh in. Um, sometimes you'll have a sensitivity reader making sure you're handling sensitive topics appropriately. There are a lot of people who, um, who chime in and make sure that the book is is hitting the right tone that that it's supposed to. And so I'm grateful to be part of a team and not just be doing it on my own. That's sometimes people ask me about self publishing and I say, gosh, it's great, but it feels daunting to me because I'd be nothing without my editors and the copy editors and the marketing people who read the book and ask good questions and my agent and all of these people who contribute to sort of the well-roundedness and the polishedness of the book. And I am so grateful for them. Yeah. I think we can already guess your feelings on book bans, but <laughs> what would you like kids our age to understand about? I mean, there are some amazing memes or cartoons out there that I feel like say it better than I can. Um, there's one cartoon that somebody drew that has in the top half a person outside giving out a list of banned books and then in the bottom half a person who's taken that list goes to the library and gets all of those books um, <laughs> you know so it's a uh, i don't understand book banning i don't understand i mean i do i but i i don't agree with it obviously i think is what i'm trying to say um i'm anti-book banning i think it's okay to decide that a book isn't for you, but to decide that it's not for anybody is a big leap. And I've encountered in my author career already a lot of disconnect between the adults who are sort of the gatekeepers to books and the kids who are actually reading them. Um, for example, with Aftermath, I had a ton of editors first and then later, once it was published, a lot of parents tell me that seventh graders were not aware of the existence of school shootings. And I was like, I'm sorry to be the one to tell you, but I think they know Like kids start doing lockdown drills in kindergarten, sometimes before kids read the news. They, 
you know, some kids have phones or access to social media. Kids are way more well-informed than we are. And it is our job to give them opportunities to start conversations about hard things. So my response to book banning is, I feel sad for kids who don't have access to the one book that might answer the burning question inside them. And that's why we keep fighting to make sure that those books are available. And I want to be that person who gets the list of banned books and is like, oh, I'm going to go get these from the library and make sure the kids in my neighborhood are reading them. Because I think a lot of times the books that are banned are, are some of the, the really important ones. They're the scary ones. Like if somebody's so afraid of it, it must be pretty powerful, right? And I hope, again, sort of like the, the gun violence question, I hope we're reaching a political turning point where this is not going to be an issue anymore and we'll see some new legislation that protects free speech. But I think overall the message is like if a book, you know, when I'm writing a book, I say to myself, okay, this book is not for everybody, but it's definitely for somebody. Every book is for somebody. And so my goal is to make sure that that one kid or hopefully more than one, that one kid or that one adult who is looking for a conversation starter with the kid can find their way to that book so that they get the message or the, the representation that they need in that moment. It doesn't mean everyone in the world has to read the book and love it. It doesn't speak to everybody, but it has to speak to one person at least. And our hope is just that that one person finds the book. So we have to make all the books available. And then I think if parents wanna limit what their kids are reading individually, I'm never gonna tell another parent what to do. But as a parent, I do like to let my kids read books about topics that interest them, even if that means they're books about things that scare them or things that concern them, because those are the conversations we start having at home. And those are the important things we have to talk about. Yeah. Um, are you concerned at all about like artificial intelligence and its future in publishing? Um, overall, no. I'm an optimist. I think AI is just not as good as we are. I think AI doesn't have the empathy and the um, human kindness that we have. I I don't think AI can write books that are gonna um, make strike you cry. Hearts. What? Like make you cry? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, but also, I have a friend who works in tech and. Um, I've asked her this question and, and she's explained that, um, I don't know, it, it's sort of the industry is aware of the limitations of AI and everybody's trying to kind of hedge their bets now, but that many companies and large entities are discovering that we cannot replace humans across the board with AI. There are ways that AI is great. Like there are a lot of medical and healthcare ways that AI is double checking work and making sure that things don't fall through the cracks and that's great. But I think when it comes to the arts, the human touch is so crucial. And I think people can tell the difference and they can, and they care. I think people don't wanna read, like I think your podcast is a great example or a web show. I keep calling it a podcast. Um, YouTube channel, but that's fine. YouTube channel. I think your YouTube show is an important example of when you all read a book that you like, your desire to talk to the author is exactly why I don't worry so much about AI. Because this would be like a really boring interview if I was a computer. So I think what you all are doing and what a lot of readers like to do is sort of connect the work to the person who came up with it and get the behind the scenes look. And that doesn't exist with AI. So there's always going to be a thirst for work made by a creator. And I just have more faith in humanity than to think that we're going to be replaced by AI. Um, and I hope I'm right. But yeah, I mean, we did make it. So <laughs> we'll see. Can you tell us exactly where you were and your reaction when you found out af Aftermath? what's going to be published? Oh, wow, that's a great question. Um, so I found out in June of 2019, and I was in my bedroom, which was also my office, in uh, my family's apartment in Brooklyn when we still lived in New York. We now live in California. My cousins live in Brooklyn. Nice, it's a great place, I miss it. I wish I could live in both places at once, but you have to choose. So I lived there for many years, and now I get to live here, hopefully for many, many years. Um, I was working on 
uh, I think some articles or something for like my freelance journalism stuff and the email popped in that my agent saying we have an offer and I mean, I was so thrilled. It had been a really long journey to get Aftermath published because a lot of publishers did not want to talk about the topics that Aftermath grapples with, not just gun violence, but also grief and loss. A lot of people are scared to talk about hard things and I get it. And I know that's not necessarily like the big selling books, but I do think we're seeing some change. I think we understand that we need to give kids more credit. Um, kids are a lot more perceptive and um, and smart and curious than some adults give them credit for. And also our world over the past couple of years has made it so we can't hide hard things from kids. It's things like the pandemic affect everybody. So I do think I've seen a big shift, but when I started out trying to sell Aftermath, a lot of people wanted just lighthearted, funny books for middle grade. And um, I'm really grateful that my editor fell in love with it and took a chance on it and worked with me to make it the best version of itself. Um, and that editor is Amy Fitzgerald at Learner Publishing and, and she's phenomenal. She also edited The Color of Sound. So I'm just incredibly lucky to work with people who get it. Um, what writer has influenced you the most? Like, which one do you? I'd say Lois Lowry. Um, I really? read I read The Giver when I was 13. It came out in 1993 and I was either in seventh or eighth grade, I'm not sure. And I just remember that book changed my mind, um, changed my brain and the way that I saw the world. I think up until that point, I had not read anything dystopian and I had not read anything like The Giver where the adults, spoiler alert, um, made bad choices and they were well, wrong. I read it, so. <laughs> okay, good. We we interviewed her. I know. I saw that. It's amazing. It's really amazing. So cool. She's incredible, and I love that she's still writing spectacular books. And, I mean, she's brilliant. Um, so The Giver was the first time I'd read a book where the parents were kind of openly um, – imperfect and the adults all around by the end of the book you wondered like are the people in charge making the right choices like is this a good idea are they are they doing the right thing and so many books i had read the parents weren't necessarily perfect but overall their choices were sort of considered to be you know good because they were parents and so the Giver was the first time I read a book where I was like, oh, wow, just because I mean, I know this sounds oversimplified, but this idea that just because somebody is an adult or a parent or a certain age does not mean that they're always going to make the right choices or have the right perspective or be looking out for the right interests. And, and that was just like it hit me at a moment in my life where I was so ready to learn that lesson. And that book forever has an impact on me. And my older child is going to read it in school this year. And so I'm going to so I'm going to read it again so that we can, you know, and like keep up with their class and um, so we can discuss it along the way. And I'm really excited. The yeah. funny thing is, um, Ms. Lowry didn't like dystopian. Yeah, she didn't read them for fun at all. So I not to put myself in the same category as Lois Lowry. But I would say the same thing. When I wrote Aftermath, I couldn't believe I was writing it because I was like, I don't like books that discuss death. I don't like sad things. I don't like books where kids have died. I like all of those things were no's for me as a reader. But I sort of feel like part of the reason those were no's for me as a reader is because they scared me so much. And as I said before, sometimes you know the story you need to write is the one that scares you the most. So it sort of made sense. And then with The Color of Sound, it has the time travel element. And before yeah. that, I would have told you, I don't like magic realism. I don't like time travel. I don't like things that can't be explained, that kind of stuff. And then I went and wrote a book that had all of those elements. And so I think it's part of the learning experience for me is as a writer is to ask myself, why, why do I not like those books? What am I scared of? What is so out of control about those things that obviously strikes a strong reaction with me? And then what is it that I need to write to work through that? And so now I'm like, I want to read all of the time slip time travel books that I can find. It's like something I needed to get through. So in a way, it doesn't surprise me that Lois Lowry says she didn't necessarily love dystopian books before that. Sometimes I think we have those strong reactions to types of books because it's something we need to work through. And then we end up 
writing about it. Yeah, but I, but I, but I love magic or time travel books. Well, I know I do now too. I just, I think, I mean, it all comes back to like book bans. I mean, I didn't, I haven't banned other people from reading those books, but I had an idea in my head about what I liked and what I didn't like. And it's beautiful to see that even at my age of 44, I can change my mind and I can try something new and be like, oh, now I'm really into time slip and the sort of what if and the how did that happen and more comfortable with not understanding how something works and being okay with like, there's no explanation. It just is. Um, but you know, how great that we can change and grow. It would be really boring if we never pushed outside our comfort zones. So I'm, I'm grateful I took that chance. I actually just finished reading a book that comes out in March of um, 2025 that also has a time glitch and a Jewish main character. Oh, nice. What book? Right Back at You um, by, by, by Carolyn Mackler. Cool. I haven't uh, heard about it yet, but it sounds, I mean, already it's got two things I like, so I'll put it on my TBR. Um, what did I say for your words? Um, so much. Where to begin? Um, first of all, I think every story has merit and every story that you want to tell needs to be told. Um, I definitely thought when I was younger that like I needed to have really big dramatic experiences in order to be able to tell stories that were big and dramatic. And yeah. that's not true on a number of levels. One is that we have imaginations for a reason. So you can imagine anything you want. There are no rules. But also secondly, that you don't have to live this big, scary, dramatic life in order to be an interesting person. I think what makes people interesting and smart is them being kind and observant and thoughtful. And um, sometimes it's the smallest stories that can have the biggest impact. So I, I no longer think that you have to have certain experiences to be able to write interesting stories. Um, I think that's something that is taught to us a lot um, in academic settings that, you know, use your pain to write stuff. The great writers were tortured, you know, tortured poets, things like that. And it's not true. Um, but I do, I think my biggest advice for aspiring writers is, is sort of what I said earlier about the baseball statistics to remember <laughs> that quote unquote failure is part of the process. I've learned something valuable from every single book I've written, even if it never gets published and that the goal can't always be publication or perfection or a certain end point. Sometimes the journey is the point. Sometimes writing the book is what you need to do, even if you end up putting it in a drawer. Sometimes it's the process that was important. And you just never know until you do it. And you learn something from every single experience. And, and I think I went into writing being really goal oriented. And I was kind of in a hurry. And I was like, I want to publish everything and I want to publish it right away. And there are ways to share stories without traditional publishing. You know, if you have something to say, like I have found a lot of um, a lot of joy and a lot of solace in journalism and and writing personal essays or uh, researched articles and sometimes that's the way to tell a story sometimes you know i used to be an actor sometimes that's the way to tell the story and now with books sometimes a story wants to be a book but there are so many different ways to get your story out there um i mean you guys are storytelling with this show this is like an incredible way you all are already doing it you're you're storytellers and I just, I think in so many ways, technology is making it easier for us all to tell our stories. Um, it can make it harder to find other people's stories because there's so much content out there. But, um, but I do think it's easier to share your stories and your ideas with people and get the kind of feedback that's an important part of that process. And that in and of itself is a beautiful thing. Um, but I wish I'd understood a lot earlier how much um, the, the, failure part is part of the journey and is just necessary and you can't learn anything without falling down first. So um, that would be my big thing. Yeah, in uh, 2026, you are coming out with a picture book, Always Enough Love. Mm -hmm. uh, why did you decide to write a picture book all of a sudden? And like, what can you tell us about it? Um, I started writing picture books long before I ever wrote a novel. I started writing that particular picture book in 2009, I believe, I have an email I sent to myself with the first draft of it. And I found it a couple years ago. 
um, and realized that I, you know, I, I was still working on it, but I hadn't realized how long I had actually been working on it. And some stories are just, uh, they, they have to bake for a while. I think that one was kicking around in my head and it wasn't until later when I figured out how to tell that story and what to do with it once I told it. Um, I also have another picture book coming out also next year in, or 2026, which is almost next year. Um, so I have two picture books coming out that year, which is really exciting. That second one hasn't been announced yet, but it is um, based on the story of my husband's grandmother, who was a very important person in my life and her escape from Germany following Kristallnacht and uh, her journey to, um, you know, through Europe to England, to Canada, to the United States, traced by some Jewish traditions. And it was really meaningful to me to get to write that story. And, she's no longer with us and it was special to feel connected to her and to try and connect her to my children who didn't get to know her um so i think there are all different kinds of inspirations of why we write stories and why um why now is the right time to tell that story but i'm excited to expand you know the same way that i'm i'm excited to do these picture books in addition to middle grade i have the ya baseball story that i hope gets published and i and i just want to write across all the age spectrums um for within the kids world um i don't think i want to write for adults but i've learned to never say never um but i just love you know ya all the way down to picture books and everything in between what are you writing right now hopefully a middle grade book Yes, I am working on another middle grade book right now. Um, yes, and I'm, I'm actually talking to a couple editors about that one. Um, and so hopefully it will come your way soon ish. Um, it's a little bit about activism, which is something that has become really important to me. And not just activism, but allyship, like the idea of fighting for something that that you know is right, even if it doesn't personally affect you. Um, and that's based on my experience writing Aftermath, because um, the, the conversation around gun violence and school shootings is really important to me. So people often ask me if I personally experienced gun violence, and uh, thank God so far I have not. But that doesn't mean that it's not important to me. I can empathize and see it happening to other people and it can feel urgent and personal to me because I care about humanity. So sort of taking that idea of like, how do we learn to fight for what's right, even when it doesn't directly affect us, but then also step back when somebody else's voice needs to be heard on that issue and the balance of being an ally, um, which makes it sound like a message book and it's also fun and funny. So hopefully it's fun and funny. <laughs> Finally, it's time for a turbo tip. Okay. Um, let's head in rapid five questions. Are you ready? ready? Well, I'm ready, but I have to warn you, as you can tell, I like to talk a lot and I'm not good at short answers, but I am going to try. Okay. <laughs> okay. Number one, what is your favorite phrase to use? My favorite phrase to use? I use OMG a lot, like an embarrassing amount a lot. <laughs> Oh, number two, what subject would you love to learn more about? Uh, science, medicine. Um, I'm fascinated by things like vaccines and cures, all of the like new technology coming out about how people are curing forms of cancer and stuff. It's like that stuff fascinates me. If I were going to pick another career, I would want to learn more about that. Number three, what's your go-to snack food? Chocolate. Dark chocolate, <laughs> chocolate with peanut butter, peanut butter cups, anything with chocolate. Ah. Number four, what was your favorite book growing up? I mean, The Giver, as soon yeah. as I read it. Um, before that, I remember my mom used to read us, um, or my parents would take turns reading us, first Little House on the Prairie, the whole series, and then Anne oh, of Green Gables. I love that series. Yes. Anne of Green Gables, too. Yes, Anne of Green Gables. So oh. those are like the, those I was raised on. Um, and uh what else like all of a kind family and my mom would read us um, too. yeah my mom would read us rav gadalia stories um which are like jewish folk stories um and yeah i love i love jewish folk tales and i someday want to write something that's like a modern interpretation of a jewish folk tale but i i haven't found the sticky idea yet but someday i will but i i was definitely raised on a lot of those stories and musical theater like i, I was raised on oh. a lot of musicals so those were also like the stories of my childhood 
Number five. If you could teleport somewhere right now, where would you go? Um, I would go to Maryland or New York where my family lives on the East Coast um, and just give my parents a hug, my aunt in New York. Come visit us. I could visit you guys. Um, yeah, I, I wish I could say it again. We're in Buffalo. <gasps> Amazing. Well, so I'd, I'd add you to my teleportation trip. But um, yeah, I wish I could more easily get back to the East Coast where my my parents and my aunts and uncles are. Um, but luckily, through the magic of airplanes, occasionally we all get to. But, you know, it would be very cool to just teleport there. Yeah. Number six. If you could have one superpower, what would it be? Teleporting. <laughs> being able to just get places be like oh i want a croissant i'll go to paris and get obviously a chocolate filled croissant yeah. um you know or i want to give my mom a hug or like i want to visit my aunt she's in new york i'll just teleport there that would be amazing number seven what was your favorite cartoon as a kid so crazy story i grew up not watching any tv or cartoons or anything like nothing so I'm going to say, in hindsight now, revision, I've watched a lot of Bluey in recent years with my kids to make up for all the cartoons I didn't watch as a kid. So I hope it's okay to say Bluey. I love that show. It would really make me cry. So good. Its accent is very cute. So good, yes. Bluey's a girl. Oh, really? Yeah. Well. Wow. <laughs> Number eight. What's your favorite rainy day activity? I mean, reading, is it bad if I just uh, stick to yeah. being very on brand? Yeah, reading or like yeah. watching a movie, you know, some kind of story, storytelling um, and with like a hot cup of coffee. I love coffee. Um, yeah. So, yeah. Number nine, if you could have any three dinner guests, who would they be? Ooh, do they have to be alive or can they be from history? No. No they rule. can be deceased. Okay. And my they grandfather. Can be a fictional character. Okay. So my three dinner guests. My grandfather, who I never got to meet. His name was Alan. Um, either Anne of Green Gables or L.M. Montgomery. Anne of Green Gables. She'd be so nice. She'd be like. She'd be really fun. Okay. Oh, Anne of Green Gables. Like, it's just so ghastly beautiful. Yes, <laughs> exactly. She would have fun things to say. Um, and then um, myself as a little kid, because Ooh. I think it would be awesome color of sound style to meet my younger self. So, would that be really cool? I never thought about your friend, or maybe myself as when I'm older. That'd be really cool. You're probably oh, the yeah. first to say that. Oh yeah, I uh, I mean, I don't know. I just think it would be so interesting. I mean, that's a pretty cool answer. Thanks. Number 10. What is the best piece of advice you've ever given? You were ever given? Um, I think it would have to be that nobody is judging you as harshly as you judge yourself. Like, I think I can be hard on myself. I can be a little bit of a perfectionist and not cut myself a break. And one of my friends said to me, you know, why are you, you're treating yourself in a way that you would never treat your friends or your kids or your husband or anybody that you care about? Like, why can't you be kinder to yourself? And I think that's pretty good advice and has helped me a lot. And I think also just extends to the general idea of like, gosh, when you have the choice, just be kind to people. Like it costs nothing and it's really better for the world. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. You were awesome. Thank you so much for doing that. And thank you so thank much you. for spending the time with us. We can't thank wait you all to for having me. Off. This was so fun. Yeah, I'll keep in touch and I'll send you early copies of my of my next several books as they come out. Thank so. you so much. Yeah, let's thank keep you. in touch for sure. Bye. Thank you so much for having me. This was so fun.